Welcome to the flipped lesson on literary impressionism in Heart of Darkness. This is the standard copyright notice for all my flipped lessons. This link may not be shared with anyone. Before we proceed, we should review what we mean by impressionism in art, where it is more well known. Let's have a look at this painting by Claude Monet, titled Impression of a Rose Garden. We can see quite clearly that it is a garden and the trees are making a tunnel even though there are no clear lines or outlines. We need to step further away to see this and in fact the closer we look at the painting the more difficult it becomes to see it. The small dabs of colour which appear merely as separate strokes of paint when seen close up become lively depictions of trees when we view them from a distance. In this way we can see that this is a tunnel of trees through the emphasising of light, colour and shadow. Monet's blurry brush strokes are used to blend colours and we are made to feel we are walking through trees. It is the effect the painting has on us that tells us this is a tunnel of trees rather than any clear tunnel the artist has drawn. Monet has painted an impression of walking through trees and it is left up to the viewer to decide what we are actually walking through. In this way, it is also open to interpretation. We can see the same thing in this painting, Arrival of the Normandy Train, also by Monet, who took his easel to the Saint-Lazare railroad station in Paris and painted a series of works in the train shed. Instead of focusing on the human drama of arrival and departure, Monet was fascinated by the play of light amid the steam of the trains and the clouds we can glimpse through the glass roof. Impressionists created art that did not necessarily rely on realistic depictions. They were more interested in capturing them in the moment. This makes mood and atmosphere very important. Traditional Victorian paintings, such as this one, A Private View at the Royal Academy by William Powell Frith, painted in 1883 with their idealised portrayals, gave way to attempts to capture the subjectivity of visual experience. Instead of painting objects and people how they might have objectively appeared, Impressionist artists painted landscapes and objects as they saw them in the moment and under certain conditions. The Impressionist movement was also well suited to literature, and we call this literary Impressionism. Instead of blurry brush strokes that we see in paintings, writers painstakingly created mood and atmosphere doing away with objective depiction. We see descriptions of how the character sees the world around them. For example, instead of clearly stating the character is walking on a beach, the Impressionist writer will rely on strong sensory details to describe the texture of the sand beneath her feet or the salty smell of the sea. Thus, the writer creates an emotional landscape, a descriptive response of the character and consequently the reader to a specific setting or event in the story. We read the character's momentary impression of the world rather than any clear details of the reality, leaving us to form our own interpretations. We can see this in Heart of Darkness when Marlowe says, I saw a face amongst the leaves on the level with my own, looking at me very fierce and steady. Then suddenly, as though a veil had been removed from my eyes, I made out, deep in the tangled gloom, naked breasts, arms, legs, glaring eyes, the bush was swarming with human limbs in movement, glistening of bronze colour. The twigs shook, swayed and rustled, the arrows flew out of them, and then the shutter came to. We experience these fleeting actions and emotions with Marlowe as they are happening and before he has had a chance to process the information. The details appear unclear as reported by the mind's eye. Observe the attention to colour, movement and sensory imagery. It is interesting to note that at this point he is under attack, yet it takes him a few more lines before he realises this which further enhances the sense that the reader is experiencing the attack with the narrator. This is literary impressionism. Next, we have The Manipulation of Time 
and lack of linear or chronological structure, which was typical of Victorian novels. This emphasizes how and why things happen rather than the order in which they occur. Since our subjective experience does not feel linear, think about how time seems to slow down during class and speed up during lunch, neither does impressionist literature. Much of modernist literature presents impressionistic moments in the lives of its characters, especially when these characters attempt to process unfamiliar surroundings and fast-moving events. We can see this slowing down of time, as though in a car accident, in the same quote, when Marlowe is trying to process the appearance of the Africans from behind the bush. We can see it in this one too, when he is floating on his steamboat in the mist. To me it seemed as though the mist itself had screamed from all sides at once did this tumultuous and mournful uproar arise. It culminated in a hurried outbreak of almost intolerably excessive shrieking, which stopped short. Marlowe describes, using sensory imagery, only what he sees, the mist, and what he hears, loud shrieking and then silence. He does not actually describe what is happening. Instead, we read how he experiences the event, and then we interpret it ourselves, deciding that his boat is surrounded by screaming people whom he cannot see. The narration has slowed down, and we have slowed down with it. Marlowe takes time to process what is happening, and so do we. I want to speak now about the narrative device called delayed decoding. This was coined by the literary critic Ian Watt, who says this is the method by which the author gives direct narrative expression to the way in which consciousness elicits meaning from its perceptions. In other words, Conrad is famous for withholding any evidence a reader can use to unravel the meaning of the story. He presents an impression, but does not give or explain its meaning until later. Remember that atmospheric interference can alter our perspective from Monet's painting. Literary impression implies a field of vision which is controlled by the conditions surrounding the observer. Let's look at when the steamboat is under attack by natives loyal to Kurtz. Marlowe narrates, Sticks, little sticks, were flying about. Tick, they were whizzing before my nose, dropping below me, striking behind me against my pilot house. All this time the river, the shore, the woods were very quiet, perfectly quiet. I could only hear the heavy splashing thump of the stern wheel and the patter of these things. We cleared the snag clumsily. Arrows by Jove! We were being shot at. Marlowe realises only later that these sticks, little sticks, are arrows being shot at them. This is because, one, our minds are usually busy with distractions. Here, Marlowe has to take control of the ship. Two, interpretations are distorted by habitual expectations. So Marlowe mistakes the unfamiliar arrows for familiar sticks. And number three, there is more in our range of vision than we can pay full attention to. In this case, the helmsman has just been killed and Marlowe is busy looking at him. This is, perhaps, Conrad's most impressionistic device, his refusal to name something until after he has described it. For anyone, the passage from stick to arrow would take much less than a second. However, in the distorted and elongated time frame of the attack in the non-linear time, in which adrenaline stops the heart, stops time itself, the instant of recognition is also agonisingly prolonged. Indeed, we seem to be caught in a sort of epistemological sejura. Monet spoke of trying to see the world as a pattern of nameless colour patches, as might a man born blind who has suddenly regained his sight. We see this again, a few paragraphs later, when Conrad records first the impressions that an event makes on Marlowe, and only later do we see an explanation of the event. When his boat is suddenly attacked, Marlowe is unable to explain why his helmsman suddenly falls down. The end of what appeared a long cane clattered round and knocked over a little camp stool, 
My feet felt so warm and wet that I had to look down. The man had rolled on his back and stared straight up at me. Both his hands clutched that cane. It was the shaft of a spear. My shoes were full. A pool of blood lay very still, gleaming dark red under the wheel. The reader realises only gradually what has happened, and thus shares in the experience of Marlowe's perplexity. Consider the scene where Marlowe comes across the head staked onto poles. Delayed decoding is possibly why we are not directly led to make a moral judgment, as we would typically do. Despite the Russian harlequin mentioning how Kurtz is bad, very bad, Marlowe does not understand what those figures mean until later, and even then he does not directly link Kurtz to this horror. The horror of death and Kurtz's irrational murders diminish in force against the vividness of pure impression impressions. The question is, does this tactic prevent us from focusing on the actual horror? A similar structure dominates the narrative on a larger scale, as Marlowe continually jumps around in the telling of his story, layering impressions from various times in his attempt to make sense of his experience. This style resulted in breaking up the temporal continuity or linear narration associated with the 19th century novel. Conrad's use of multiple narrators and framed narration also undermines the Victorian convention of narrative omniscience. In fact, the famous literary critic F. R. Leavis complained that Conrad frequently seemed intent on making a virtue out of not knowing what he means. Yet, this technique for forcing the reader to share the impressions of the characters became central to modernist fiction. In this way, the impressionist narrative style is deliberately ambiguous and there is more responsibility on the reader to form her own conclusions about events within the novel rather than relying on the narrator. We know this from the very beginning when our unnamed narrator says, the yarns of seamen have a direct simplicity, the whole meaning of which lies within the shell of a cracked nut. But Marlowe was not typical if his propensity to spin yarns be accepted, and to him the meaning of an episode was not inside like a kernel, but outside, enveloping the tale which brought it out only as a glow brings out a haze, in the likeness of one of these misty halos that sometimes are made visible by the spectral illumination of moonshine. The meanings of Heart of Darkness evade the interpreter. They are larger than the story itself. This is also a warning that this novella will not be easy to unravel. Conrad wrote that a work of art is very seldom limited to one exclusive meaning and not necessarily tending to a definite conclusion, and this for the reason that the nearer it approaches art, the more it acquires a symbolic character. In this way, this is a typically modern text, as it is open to interpretation. Indeed, Marlowe's journey to Central Africa to confront the power made Kurtz can be interpreted in several ways, such as a political statement about imperialism and race, a critique of bureaucracy, a journey to the centre of the self, a descent into hell, or even as a voyage up the birth canal. There is no single interpretation, as we well know. This can also be seen in the opaline haze on the Thames. This warns the reader that Marlowe's tale will not be centred on, but in fact surrounded by, its meaning. Conrad's meaning is only visible in the unnoticed dust particles and water vapour in a space that normally looks dark and void. This also reminds the reader that one characteristic of Impressionist paintings is that the artist's subject is coloured by his representation of the atmospheric conditions through which it is observed, and may therefore not be entirely reliable. In fact, Monet responded to his critics, poor blind idiots, they want to see everything clearly through the fog. For Monet, the fog in a painting, like a narrator's haze, is not an accident which stands between the public and a clear view of the artist's so-called real subject. The conditions under which the viewing is done are an essential part of what the pictorial or the literary artist sees and therefore tries to convey.
Virginia Woolf, writing some years later, wrote, Life is not a series of gig lamps symmetrically arranged, but a luminous halo, a semi-transparent envelope surrounding us from the beginning of consciousness to the end. In the same way, Heart of Darkness accepts the ambiguous nature of human understanding. Marlowe's journey through the Congo explores how one individual's knowledge of another can mysteriously change the way in which he sees the world. He embodies uncertainty and doubt and represents how much a man cannot know, making this a very modern text and in direct contrast to Victorian certainty. I hope this lesson on literary symbolism has given you some avenues to explore. Remember that Impressionism is taking the visual interpretation or impression of a specific moment in time. It creates the impression of experience and leaves the interpretation of the events or purpose of the story to the reader. Heart of Darkness, understood in this way and lived through the consciousness of Marlowe, is an Impressionist work. It is evident at times that Marlowe represents what we cannot know. He begins his tale by mentioning to the other sailors that what he experienced affected him personally, but that some of his impressions are not clear and will probably never be. Given that Conrad provides us first with Marlowe's vivid description and later with his interpretation of the event described, the force of the impression begins becomes stronger than the understanding of it. The impact becomes stronger than the understanding. Even before he begins a story, Marlowe says that the most he can talk about are his inner impressions. Thus, we will never be allowed outside Marlowe's consciousness and outside his impressions. This style makes us engage with his inner thoughts, but leaves little objectivity towards what is actually happening. This is another way that Marlowe is an unreliable narrator. This concludes our lesson on literary impressionism in Heart of Darkness. There are several things you can do now which will help you to improve, such as researching the narrative style and structure of Heart of Darkness, or seeing how this text is an example of early modernism, that is, it is a proto-modern text. It will also be beneficial to pick passages from the text and to analyse them and see how they fit into the context they were created in. Of course, as always, it is up to you to take the next step.